Okay, let's go ahead and start. <coughs> I believe we left off. <clears throat> um, Page 60 and 61 in the shadow of the past. So we finished talking about <clears throat> Frodo saying not having any pity for Gollum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and Gandalf says you hasn't, haven't seen him. Top of page 60, Frodo says, why did you let me keep it? Why didn't you make me throw it away or, or destroy it? And Gandalf kind of you know, says, haven't you been listening? You couldn't if you wanted to. You are not thinking of what you are saying. As for throwing it away, that was obviously wrong. These rings have a way of being found, blah, blah, blah. So he goes back to, well, what about destroying it? Bottom of the page, Gandalf, uh, towards the bottom of the page. Frodo asks that. And... Gandalf says, would you? How would you do that? How would you destroy the ring? Go ahead, try it. Uh, you know, you can hammer it or melt it. Try. Try now. Frodo pulls the ring out of his pocket, looks at it, and notice the gold looked very fair and pure. And Frodo thought how rich and beautiful was its color, how perfect was its roundness. In other words, the ring's already got him. He's not possessed by it, but the ring has already filled, you know, um, the delight of the eyes, so to speak. Okay, so Gandalf laughs. Told you. Top of the next page, sixty-one. Gandalf keeps talking. Says it cannot be unmade by your hands or by mine. He says, you know, your fire wouldn't even melt ordinary gold. So how do you think it's going to melt this one? He goes, no, you, want to, you really want to destroy it, Frodo? Here's how. There's only one way, about a third of the way down 61. There's only one way to find the cracks of doom in the depths of Ordru in the Fire Mountain, also called Mount Doom, and cast the ring in there. If you really wish to destroy it. Okay? To put it beyond the grasp of the enemy forever. Look at Frodo's response. Now, his response makes perfectly good sense in reply to how Gandalf phrases the question, essentially. Okay? If you really wish to destroy it, to put it beyond the grasp of the enemy, who's the agent there? You. You, Frodo. If you really wish to destroy it, this is what you must do. Look at Frodo's response. I do really wish to destroy it. Or, well, to have it destroyed. What's the difference between those two sentences? One is active and one is passive. One uses active voice and the other uses passive voice. Active voice, the subject is doing the work. Passive voice... Uh, the subject's not clear. It's the difference between, you know, a news article, uh, you know, something. John Smith, driving his, you know, Chevy Suburban, ran into XYZ. Or a Chevy Suburban ran into. And you'll see that all the time, by the way, in newspapers and stuff. The only problem with the latter one is what? Chevy Suburbans don't drive by themselves. There, there's always somebody behind the wheel, okay? So, Frodo initially takes ownership, so to speak. I do really wish to destroy it. But then he says, or to have it destroyed. Why? Why switch to passive? He doesn't want to do it. Yes, exactly. He doesn't want to do it, okay? What does that entail? Doing it. Going all the way out to Mount Doom and chucking that thing in the fire yourself. Going to hell, <laughs> essentially. And throwing it away yourself. Or to have it done. That is, yeah, I really wish somebody else would take care of the problem for me. And we can go back to Frodo's initial statement. 
I wish it need not have happened in my time. Yeah, well, so does everybody. And so does everybody wish somebody else would take care of the problem. I saw a little thing the other day. Um, over the weekend, I don't watch Bill Maher because he's too crude and foul for me. And he's too far left. I'm pretty far right. He's way on the other side. But over the last year, he's been, you know, really sticking his side. For example, one of the things he said over the weekend that kind of stuck with me and it, it kind of resonates here. Is he said, you know, we ought to help that help the Afghans. We ought to bring as many refugees over as we can. And we ought to be willing to put them in our own homes, etc. And the people are clapping and everything. And he said, yeah, and y'all are clapping because you think that means putting them in somebody else's home. And apparently it went pretty quiet. Okay. Why? Because we all talk about, oh, we want to solve this problem, that problem. But what do we really mean? Not we want to solve it. You over there solve it. I am not made for perilous quests. <clears throat> I wish I'd never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? In the author's note, in my fantasy lit course, we're doing the Chronicles of Printing by Lloyd Alexander. And in the author's note to this book, he makes the comment, <clears throat> Chronicle Pridain is a fantasy. Such things never happen in real life. Or do they? Most of us are called on to perform tasks far beyond what we can do. Most of us are called on to perform tasks far beyond what we can do. Our capabilities seldom match our aspirations. And we are often woefully unprepared. Think of that and what Frodo just said. I am not made for perilous quests. Why not? Why doesn't he think he's made for these things? A little hobbit. He's just a hobbit. Excuse me. He's just a hobbit. Who is made, so to speak, for perilous quests? Gandalf. Gandalf? Who else? Heroes, great mighty warriors, you know, Aragorns, Legolas's, Gimli's even to an extent. He's not much taller than, than uh, Frodo. People who are, so to speak, naturally brave. What is Frodo really saying? Is anybody really naturally brave? What's, what's the hallmark of definite, or hallmark definition of bravery? Being scared, but still doing whatever the job is. Okay? I wish I'd never seen the ring. Yep. Why did it come to me? That, why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? That's really a two word question. Three word question, sorry. What's, what are the three words? Why me, God? Why me? Gandalf, such questions cannot be answered. Next. Why can such questions not be answered? It is not the place of man to know the will of the gods. <laughs> it's beyond our pay grade. <laughs> That's like saying, why does the universe exist? Physics can't answer that. They can answer how. They can't answer why, astrophysicists. They can say how maybe the Big Bang occurred. They can't really. It's as big a myth as any other myth. But they can't say why. They can't answer that all-important question, why, of anything. Okay. So, next question. <laughs> You may be sure it was not for any merit that others do not possess. 
not for power or wisdom at any rate. You weren't chosen, Frodo, because of your power or your wisdom. Or you weren't chosen because nobody else possesses the power and wisdom that will be needed for this. So what does Gandalf kind of immediately <clears throat> striking off as the kind of qualities that are needed for this particular quest? It's not for the biggest, brawniest person in the Fellowship of the Ring, as we will see it later comprised, maybe even today, who's the, the biggest, brawniest person of those nine walkers? Boromir. Boromir, by far. He's bigger and brawnier than Aragorn. Aragorn's lean, he's muscular, but he's not brawny. I mean, think of it. Boromir's kind of like Conan the Barbarian. He's Schwarzenegger at his prime. Okay? So, it's not for that, and it's not for wisdom. It's not... I'm going to use a, another term for wisdom that... It's a bad term to use, but I'm going to use it anyways. He's not a brainiac, because wisdom isn't just smarts. Wisdom is street smarts. Okay? Not intellectual smarts, so to speak. So, it's not for strength, and it's not for wisdom. What else is there? I mean, really, what else is there? If it's not because of how smart you are or how well you deal with problems, that's wisdom, and it's not because of your strength, what more do you have to go on? But you have been chosen, and you must therefore use such... Now, he uses two of the words in different form, but he adds a third one, such... Strength and heart and wits. Strength, power, wits, wisdom. What's heart? What French word kind of equates to heart, but it implies bravery? Courage. Courage. What's courage? It's not backing down even in the face of death. That is, even when you know you're going to die. It's not backing down. It's still standing up. <clears throat> There's going to be a scene. Sorry. There's going to be a scene in the Harry Potter novels where Harry's going to be crouching, hiding, and he thinks to himself, I'm not going to die this way. I'm not going to die crouching. I'm going to die standing up. <laughs> Implying bullseye. Okay? But I'm going to die standing, facing death, not running and turning away from it. So, you must use such strength and heart and wits as you have. But I have so little of any of these things. Strength? How much strength does Frodo have? Yeah, a little bit. Wits? He's already shown us. He's not the A-plus student, right? He's not genius IQ level. Because it took him an awful long time to really hear what Gandalf was saying. Heart? We don't know about that yet. Will you not take the ring? He says, you are wise and powerful. See what I mean about his IQ? What did Gandalf say? It's not wisdom or strength. You are wise and powerful. You are wise. You are powerful. Will you not take the ring? Is that really Frodo? Or is that the ring kind of speaking through Frodo? What did Gandalf say earlier about the ring? When it slipped off Gollum's finger, what was it trying to do all those years ago? Get back to its master. 
assume for a moment, play a you know speculation kind of game. What would happen should Gandalf say, yes, Frodo, I will take the ring. What do you think would happen back in Barad-dur, where Sauron dwells? I'll bet his little ring radar would beep, 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 you know, start going off. Okay? Why? Because if Gandalf claims the ring, he is wise and powerful, and he is someone who could contest Sauron. See, if Frodo at this point says, I will take the ring, the ring will be mine, Sauron would probably laugh first, you know, okay. And he wouldn't even bother probably sending the nine Nazgul. He'd, you know, send something else, a lowly orc or something, all right? Gandalf, no, springing to his feet. With that power, I should have power too great and terrible. Notice he doesn't say, with that power, I should have power great, that is like all-encompassing, and terrible, to be feared. What word does Tolkien add there? Too great and terrible. Too great, too terrible. How can power, how can you have too much power? Absolute power corrupts. Lord Acton, 19th century British uh, peer, said, absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. That is, it takes over entirely. Gandalf say, is saying there is such a thing as an individual having too much power. We're going to see the same idea in the Harry Potter novels. Okay? And it would become terrible. Why? Look at what he says. Over me, the ring would gain, would gain a power still greater and more deadly. No, do not tempt me, for I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord himself. Yet the way of the ring to my heart, now he brings in that third element. Yeah, I've got the power, I've got the wisdom. The ring appeals to my heart. Why? Because of pity. Pity for weakness in the desire of strength to do good. That is, if I only had the power, I could do what? Solve the problems of the world. If I only had the power, I could make everybody get vaccinated and then we wouldn't have to wear these anymore. If I only had the power, I could, and what is, Everything that, F, that is after the I could imply for those who don't have the power. Bingo. They get controlled. What is one of the powers, let me put it this way, unforgivable powers in the Harry Potter novels? The imperious curse. Why? You take over somebody else's will. You deny them their essential autonomy. No, do not tempt me. I dare not take it. Not even to keep it safe unused. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. What does he mean? The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. I couldn't say no. Because he does see so much that needs correcting. We will have such, I will have such need of it. Woo, we could go in a bun whole bunch of different places in here. And, oh, if only Gandalf had the ring at that point. So notice, Tolkien's, should I talk about that here? Really? Oh, Tolkien is getting... At, or introducing at least the idea of ends and means or the means to achieve an end. End having that, mean, that meaning I used the other day or applied the other day of purpose. Right? What are the means, what are the powers you use 
to achieve a particular outcome, a particular purpose. He's introducing that. Gandalf is saying the ring works on him because he knows it would give me the means to do it, to achieve this purpose. Okay? So, they keep talking. Gandalf asks, page 62. I know time's going by quickly. <clears throat> what do you think about Frodo? What are you going to do? Have you decided? No. And Frodo says, middle of the page, I should like to save the Shire, if I could. Even though there's been times when I thought, man, we need a hurricane. We need an earthquake. We need to shake people out of their stupor. But I don't feel like that now. I feel that as long as the Shire lies behind, safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. In other words, Frodo says, if I've got to leave the Shire and I've got to take a long, hard, rocky road, it will make my journey, mentally for me, easier if I know everything is what at home? Louder? Safe? What else? Normal, the same. See, Frodo thinks he can leave home and everything at home becomes like what? Frozen in time. That nothing will change. Well, what's he going to learn? Because he might go off that way, but what is time doing? Time is still rolling on. I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there again, and we can jump from there and skip the entire book and go to the scouring of the Shire. When Frodo gets back home and realizes it's not all the same. Read a short story by Ernest Hemingway called Soldier's Home. It's available on the internet, and it's pretty short, but five or 10 pages. And it's all about a soldier from in World War I, as Hemingway fought in World War I, <clears throat> who leaves his small town home in, I don't remember where it is, Oklahoma or Kansas or something like that. Leaves his small town home, you know, a couple thousand people, goes off to France, sees Paris, sees Berlin, sees Rome, and then goes back home. And what you discover? Home isn't home anymore. Is it because the people there have changed? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but more importantly, he's not the same person who left. So, Gandalf is surprised when Frodo says, you know, I think I need to leave. And Gandalf says, you're not gonna go alone, and he grabs Sam and brings him in. Sam's been eavesdropping the whole time. He tells Frodo, you should make for Rivendell, okay? Not right that day. So, we're going to skip a bunch. Three is company. What gets revealed? Three is company refers to who? Frodo, Sam, and Pippin. Why not Mary? Mary's off getting things ready for where they're going to move to. Okay? So, Three's Company, Shortcut to Mushrooms. The only thing we're going to talk about in the shortcut to mushrooms, are we even there? Um, no. He meets Gildor and some elves, and they talk about some things, and Gildor says some things that don't really quite click to Frodo. We get a conspiracy unmasked. When they finally get to Crick Hollow, they tell Frodo, we're all going with you, not just Sam, <clears throat> the only one who's not going to go, Fatty Boulder, who's going to stay behind and make it look like, you know, they're still living there. And so Mary says, hey, I know a shortcut, because their idea is to get to Bree, okay? They could take the East Road, or they can take a shortcut. And where does the shortcut take them? They got to go through the old forest. They meet Old Man Willow. Old Man Willow starts to eat Mary and Pippin. Frodo cries out. And Tom Bombadil shows up to rescue them. Okay. 
in in one sense I shouldn't discuss Tom Bombadil because he doesn't play a major role in the entire novel he does play a role because his name is brought up in that second most important chapter in the first volume the Council of Elrond because they discuss maybe sending the ring to him because of what happens in this chapter so Tom Bombadil shows up sings a silly song essentially and uh, Old Man Willow opens up, Mary and Pippin get out, and he takes, him, takes them to his house. Okay? <clears throat> Let's see here. I'm gonna, we're going to pick up in the middle of that chapter, page 131. So Tom starts talking to them one evening. They've had a meal, they're well fed, they're warm and cozy, they're kind of getting a little drowsy. And Tom kind of recounts old history, but not like a historian. He recounts things he has seen. Page 131. So they're drifting kind of in and out. When they caught his words again, they found that he had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory, beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider. And the seas flowed straight to the western shore, and still on and back, Tom went singing out into ancient starlight. Okay, when the seas weren't bent, and they went straight on to the western shore, that's talking about when the world was flat. See, at their time in Middle Earth history, the world is round. But take this, you know as just a flat earth and look down upon it, you would have you know a coastline and such here. And way over here, you'd have another coastline. And this would be the Sundering Sea or the Western Sea. And you have Beleriand and other places over here. Okay, This becomes part of what later is called Middle Earth. And over here, you have Valinor, right? which is where the gods live. This is all the Tolkien Silmarillion. So, Tom is singing of his memories of, and he goes back to when this was like this, and you could sail across here and get to here, and then we're told, and he goes back beyond that. When only the elf stars were awake, then suddenly he stopped. They saw that he nodded off as if he was falling asleep. The hobbit sat still before him, enchanted. What does it mean to be enchanted? In is under. Chanted comes from Latin cantare, to sing. You are under a spell. Not like, like he's you know, taking control of their minds. It seemed as if under the spell of his words, <clears throat> the wind had gone, clouds had dried up, etc., etc. And Frodo asks a question. Who are you, master? Notice he calls him master, and it's capitalized. That could be for two reasons. What are they? Where are they, first of all? They're in his house. He's the master of his own house, okay? What's another reason? Master is the one, as in the one who controls that's one meaning of master. Another meaning is master as it derives from Latin magister, which meant teacher. So one who's in power here and teacher. Who are you? Tom, eh, what? In other words, Fredo will come up. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you? He flips the question around. Who are you? But he doesn't just question mark. Who are you alone, yourself, and nameless? Now that seems like a ridiculous question, right? How, how can you be nameless? At some point after you were born, somebody gave you a name. 
your parents, the state, you know, whatever. So who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? <clears throat> but you are young, and I am old. Eldest. That's what I am. Eldest. The est is superlative. It means you don't get any more than that. You don't get any more eld, old, than Tom. He's the oldest thing there is, he says. Or at least down here. Mark my words, my friend. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop, the first acorn. He made paths before the big people. The big people are elves and men. And saw the little people, hobbits and dwarves, arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrowites, which is what he was singing about on the previous page. And the reason he was singing about them on the previous page is because we're going to be introduced to something from that in just a few pages. When the elves passed westward, and that is when the elves, Tolkien's cosmology again, part of the Silmarillion, the elves are created first here, and they're asleep. And they wake up, looking up at the sky, and they see stars. They awake at nighttime, okay? And they see stars. And something tells them, go to Valinor. And so they make, I'm, I'm leaving a whole bunch of and so they make their way to Valinor. That is, they go west. Tom says, I was here before that happened. I was here, in fact, before they woke up. He keeps going, though. When the elves passed westward, Tom was already here, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the Dark Lord came from outside. So, take this, you know, this is the flat earth. You're looking down on it from the top, right? Go away, Siri. <clears throat> Tom is saying, Tom was here before the dark Lord came from outside. So the world and everything it contains, its atmosphere, you know, all that kind of stuff. Before the dark Lord came from out here, who's this dark Lord? Anybody know? No problem. I think I mentioned his name in this class the other day. Might have been my Tuesday, Thursday. This is Melkor, a.k.a. Morgoth. That's the name he gets here. Tom says, I was here before Melkor came in. Okay, that, that, hmm, that creates some problems. Because nothing slash nobody was here. According to at least Tolkien's Silmarillion. With maybe one exception because of Tolkien's Christian theology. Yes? Didn't uh, Melko come last to the Valor? Mm -mm. He came first. He comes, and the Valor, the gods, the Valor enter into Arda, into the world. For the purpose of countering him. Tom saying, I was here before he came. Now I kind of think I could be wrong. No one's proven to me yet that I'm wrong. I kind of think this is an indication that he is a manifestation of Iru Iluvatar. God. How could he be a manifestation of that? In a traditional Christian sense, God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do, for example, in the beginning of the book of Genesis? Broods over the waters. That is, the world is made through the Son, by the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit is kind of here. I can't help but wonder, is this partly how, how or what Tolkien meant when he said in a letter to an individual, the Lord of the Rings is fundamentally a philosophical and religious work, more so in the revising than in the writing, that when he dropped Tom Bombadil in here, because Tom Bombadil does not belong in Middle Earth, he had already written a collection of short stories about Tom Bombadil, published as The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Okay? Totally foreign from Middle Earth. And so he reaches the point, and he just kind of, Hmm, 
drops them in, and then works on revising and such. If in that revising, subconsciously, you know, he kind of worked out this. I don't know what the answer is. Tolkien does say in one of his letters, Tom Bombadil is a pacifistic spirit, or the spirit of pacifism. Just don't take up arms against anything, no matter how righteous the cause, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So, that kind of ends the talk. Okay, go back to Tom's question to Frodo. Who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? Are any of us alone? No. Are any of us, it's going to be a weird question, ourselves? Yeah, kind of. We're not nameless because others named us, but notice that implies the others. How did yourself come to be? Your parents had a good time, and you came to be, okay? What's Tom kind of implying? That there's like a super deep essence of yourself that can be not distance, but discerned among all of that. Okay, possibly, yeah. I mean, there is the, the inner I, capital I, not this kind of I. So I think you can make a case for that as well. What else? Kind of, but even the soul comes from the conception, right? But this conception has to occur because of two others. Every one of us is what on other people? Dependent. What does that word dependent literally mean? We like to think we're independent. D away from or out of pendant. Like pin this this is pendant around my neck. What does that mean? It's hanging. We hang away from others. Have you ever seen a family tree? Dad, mom, junior. And then junior gets married. And we get, you know, more. We, you just keep going back and back and back and back and back. Tom was kind of saying, not dependent. I am alone, myself, nameless. <clears throat> I don't have time to go here, but I kind of need to. <clears throat> Moses meet on Mount Sinai? God. In the burning bush. Right? And Moses says, after God tells him what he's going to have him do, um, they're going to want to know who you are. What's your name? What does God tell him? What gets translated as, I am that I am. I am what I am. Okay? <clears throat> Hebrew, it's Yahweh. Y H Y H W H. Hebrew doesn't have vowels, so Y H W H. You know the interesting thing about that name? Nobody knows exactly what it means. The best translation is kind of something like, would be, I am always existing. Or just. I am. The only I am. The only self. It's kind of the language Tom uses. Which is kind of. Doo -doo -doo. Okay. So. Tom tells him where to go. How to leave. And specifically what to avoid. What's he tell him to avoid? Barrow. Keep going. They've got to go through the Barrow Downs. What specifically in the Barrow Down should they avoid? What? 
<laughs> Stones. Each, each of the barrows, he implies, or most of the barrows, have a standing stone at the top of the barrel. A barrel. A barrel just looks like that. It's a burial mound. Go to Stonehenge sometime. Take a course in England over the summer. Take a trip to Stonehenge. Look at the pretty rocks, you know, Stonehenge itself. And then put your back to Stonehenge and look off in the fields in all directions. And you will see, I can't remember what the exact number is, but if you look really well and count, you'll see 20 or 30 barrows off in the distance. These are all burial mounds several thousand years old. All right. Each one, at some point, had somebody and or something in it. Okay. Sometimes these barrows in England have stones on them to mark, to make sure everybody is clear. This is not a natural mound. Somebody is buried here. And in Celtic mythology, which Tolkien was heavily influenced by, sometimes these barrows with these stones on them become portals to the Celtic other world, the fairy world. Don't want to go there. Right? Usually like dusk, dawn, in particular times of the year. What is called Halloween and what is called the beginning of spring, you know, the equinoxes. Right? So stay away from those. But they don't. Accidentally, why? It's foggy, they can't see where they're going, and suddenly Frodo disappears and such. So they get captured by a barrow white, skipping a whole bunch. <clears throat> Notice, when they get captured, Frodo has the opportunity to think, I could put the ring on and I could escape. I could save myself. I'd feel really bad for Sam, Mary, and Pippin, but they'd understand. All right? And he doesn't. Instead, he reaches out and he's takes a whack at that hand that's making its way towards the others. And he remembers Tom Bombadil. And he starts to sing the song that Tom Bombadil taught them to sing should they ever find themselves in trouble. Okay? So, Tom comes and rescues him. Mary, page 143, says, What in the name of wonder? And he explains what happened. The men of Karn Doom came on us at night, and we were worsted. And he goes, oh, my. And he says, no, wait, that didn't really happen. Cause... Okay. So, Tom empties out the barrel. He takes all the stuff that's in it out and exposes it to the sun. Top of 146. And in doing so, he finds some swords and knives. Old knives are long enough as swords for hobbit people. Sharp blades are good to have. He told them these blades were forged many long years ago by men of Western Essa. They were for foes of the Dark Lord, and they were overcome by the evil king of Karn Doom in the land of Angmar. Okay? A little bit of foreshadowing here, and I'm going to give a part of it away. The evil king of Angmar. Anybody know who that is? We're going to be introduced to him later. He is the lord of the Knot School, also called the Captain of the Nine. It's the Nine Black Riders. He's like Sauron's right-hand man. He is one of the nine men who has a ring of power. He is the greatest of the nine. Right? This is the captain or the king of the land of Angmar. The swords that Tom gives them, they're actually knives, but for hobbits they're swords. 
These particular swords were woven with spells by the men of Westernessa for what specific purpose? To fight against him and his forces. Why did I just spend three minutes talking about that? Because in book three, sorry, volume three, The Return of the King, one of these swords is, is going to be very important. There's going to be a big reveal, and it's going to be a reveal in two ways. One of those kind of has to do with the sword a little bit, right? So, Tom sends them on their way. We've got 10 minutes. <clears throat> they make their way to the Prancing Pony. Who do they meet in the Prancing Pony? They meet Strider, as Sam calls him, okay? Every now and then I'll kind of do voices, and a lot of my voices will have English accents, obviously, because Tolkien was a Brit, uh, but also because in the late 70s, there was a radio adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, 26 part series, 13 hours, and I pretty much got a lot of those voices, along with a lot of other voices you want, don't want to know anything about, banging around in my head, you know? <laughs> and so you'll also, you know, when we get to Gollum, um, Andy Serkis is really good as Gollum in the films, okay? But I can't remember who the actor was who did the voice um, stuff for the radio version. But he, I, I like his more. So they meet Strider at the sign of the Prancing Pony. How do they meet him? What happens? And what? Why does Fredo get on the table and start singing and dancing? Who was it? It's really important. Who was it? Pippin. It's Pippin. Pippin nearly gives everything away. Okay? And Strider's like, um, Mr. Underhill, or Baggins, you know, you better go shut him up. So Frodo kind of edges him off, and Frodo starts singing and dancing. He sticks his hands in his pocket, and what happens? The ring, okay? So he disappears, and Frodo, you know, Strider says, now you put your foot in, or should I say your finger, you know. So they take him back to their room, chapter 10, Strider. Okay. Strider says he can help them, but you, you know, we gotta, we gotta move soon, we gotta act quickly. Bottom page 165. <clears throat> okay. He says, Strider can, talking about himself in third person, Strider can take you by paths that are seldom trodden. Will you have him? In other words, will you accept my help? There's silence. Frodo's like, I don't know what to do. And Sam, with your leave, Mr. Frodo, I'd say no. Okay, now what is Sam known for? So far. Distrusting people. Say that again. Okay, what else? What's his job? What does he do for a living? Gardener. He's not a professor of philosophy, ethical relations, you know, politics. Politics merely means, you know, this, the discussion of power. It's the, how power is arranged in a polis, in a city, in a state, in a country. It's, it's all politics. Is. He's not a politician, all right? Destroyer. Here he warns and he says, take care. And I say yes to that. <laughs> Let's begin with him. <laughs> In other words, good advice. Let's apply it, Frodo. He comes out of the wild. I never heard no good of such folk. Ooh, he comes out of the wild. And we know about those people who come out of the wild, right? What's meant by the wild? He's not American. He's not one of us. He's a foreigner. Or further. Okay. He's one of them. He knows something. Okay. But he says, I don't think we should trust him. Strider. Well done, Sam. You learned that cautious lesson well. And then Barlam and Butterbur comes in and goes, there's a letter for you. Gandalf left it. You know, Frodo's ready to kill him. So he reads the letter. 
in who does the letter mention? I've got a friend. His name's Strider. You can trust him. All right? So Strider introduces himself, and he wants Frodo to take his trust on what? Kind of like faith. Believe me, I'm, I'm here to help, really. But then Frodo gets the evidence to prove it. But what does he not? What could he say at this point? How do I know you're the real Strider? And he does. And so does Sam. Okay? And notice, <clears throat> at the end of the letter, we get a couple of PSs. And there's a little poem that goes with it. All that gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. It's amazing how many cars I see with the bumper sticker. Not all who wander are lost, you know. <clears throat> so, he says, how come you didn't tell me you were Gandalf's friend? Frodo does. Would it have helped? Strider says. All I knew, I had to persuade you to trust me without proofs if I was going to help you, okay? Sam still, yeah, I don't trust him. Why not? How does Strider look? Like a wanderer. Stained, muddy, dirty. He does not look like Viggo Mortensen. Sorry. For no other reason, you could spray Viggo Mortensen with mud, and he'd still look like Viggo Mortensen. He's still too beautiful. Okay? This has got to be somebody who's attractive, and yet really looks like he's been beaten up by age. How old is Strider? Anybody know? Isn't like over 50? Well, he's 87. That doesn't mean he's 80, like our 87. Because he's a descendant of the men of Western Essa. Very long livers they are, okay? He would be like, in our world, late 40s. We're going to meet people that he meets who are in their late 40s and early 50s, and they're old and grizzled and gray and leaning on sticks and such. So... When Sam says, I still don't trust him, he could be a play-acting spy, page 171, Strider says, in response to Sam's, what do you say to that? Strider says, hold on, I'm checking to see if this is, nope, no, wrong. How many days do we have for this book? Are we supposed to finish it today? No. Don't say that. <laughs> okay. Um, we're obviously not. He says that you're a stout fellow, and I'm afraid my only answer to you is this. If I'd killed the real Strider, I could kill you. And I should have killed you already without so much talk. If I was after the ring, I could have it now. And he stands up and he suddenly towers over them. Notice what he mentioned that hasn't been mentioned yet. The ring. It was alluded to back in the main room of the tavern. Okay, But he says, I am the real Strider. I am Aragorn, son of Aragorn, etc., etc. And Frodo says... You have frightened me several times, but never in the way that servants of the enemy would, or so I imagine. I think one of his spies would, oh, I don't know, seem fairer and feel fouler, if you understand. Aragorn hears that, and he turns around. He goes, oh, okay, I get it. So I look foul and feel fair? Yeah, that's the point. He doesn't look like what you would expect. Why? What's one of the things that happens to the hobbits as they go on their little journey? And this is one of those things that I think Tolkien, in writing, has no intention of doing. It just comes out. All the little images that they've created in their minds to make the world make sense. Poof. Poof. Outsiders are not to be trusted. I mean, that's a kind of a, almost like a Shire law. Not literally, metaphorically. You, you just don't do anything with them. They are to be trusted. In fact, we're going to hear in the Council of Elrond, Strider's going to, Aragorn, is going to say something about why the hobbits can have that mentality. And he's essentially going to say, you know, and if I could... I would keep them being able to think like that. 
We kind of go, what? You would keep them xenophobic? Yeah. Why? Because they're innocent that way. They are simple and innocent. All right? Okay, we'll stop there. Yeah, we're way behind. Um, so, we'll talk briefly about the chapter Knife in the Dark. Uh, briefly about the end of Flight at the Ford. Many meetings will discuss some um, counts of Elrond. I have no idea what I was thinking when I created the syllabus. We are so far behind.